And thank you, um, Gonzalo, also for, for mentioning my, my little daughter this morning. I wish I had a photo of her to show you because she is very cute. Um, but she is thankfully much better today. So, um, but I appreciate being here today. Um, and Marina also for the, for the great introduction about CDP. You. If you've not heard about CDP before, um, please don't feel embarrassed or, or, or ashamed. Um, you are not alone. We were recently branded in the Harvard Business Review as the most influential green NGO that you've probably never heard of. So as I say, you're not alone. Um, but those that we do engage with luckily know who we are. So I'm going to give you a brief presentation um, on the potential that we feel exists within the private sector and how we can go about unlocking that and what we've been doing so far. I have got a few slides, um, but where possible, I, I won't use them. So when I talk about the private sector, I'm not talking about water utility companies. I think it's very important that we establish the difference here. We're talking about large scale, national and international organizations in the oil and gas, energy, food and beverage, metals and mining, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, agricultural supply chain companies, possibly some of the sexiest, the dirtiest, uh, the most important organizations fundamentally in the world. And when you consider their reach, the scale of the corporation is unlike anything else really in the world. And as a result, they have a huge potential, a huge responsibility and um, a massive opportunity to take action and improve the world from a water security perspective. They in fact control, use almost 70% of the world's fresh water and that's why we focus upon them and driving change within them, within CDP. So really why would they do this? Why would they engage with a relatively small NGO such as ourselves? Well our theory of change is based on the fact that we have that action within these companies or inaction within these companies poses a substantial material economic threat to their ability to generate a profit or a return both today and in the future. And that is of prime interest and concern to institutional investors worldwide. So my program operates <laughs> on behalf of 680 institutional investors worldwide. These are institutional investors, the likes of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, with more than one trillion assets under management. We work with BlackRock, HSBC, uh, Goldman Sachs, you name it, we work with them. And it's their authority, their interest, that allows us to engage with the companies in the way that we do and enables those companies to respond in the way that they do. So our vision in an, as the organization is for a thriving economy that works for people and the planet in the long term. And our mission is to focus those institutional investors, companies and cities, although I won't be talking about cities today, on taking urgent action to build a truly sustainable economy. Me by, we do that by encouraging them to measure and understand their environmental impacts. And we started our water security program in 2009, so we're almost a decade old. And at the time, it's safe to say that most companies were unprepared to deal with the challenge. If you consider the process of designing a business, building a business model, most of the business models that exist today and continue to exist today are based on some fundamental and untried and untested assumptions. One of those assumptions being that a stable supply of good quality fresh water will always be available to that business whenever it needs it, wherever it needs it. We all know in that room that that situation, that assumption is no longer valid in almost every region, whether that's because the tap will run dry because of drought or whether it's because there's a political shift and a societal shift in the view of whether that company should have access to water. And it's these factors that pose a substantial and material threat to those businesses. But as I say, when we started the programme, and all, arguably still today, many of the businesses we engage with don't quite understand that. And they're still acting and planning under the misassumption that they will have access to the water that they are, um, they are used to having. So that they are unaware of the value of water and the fact that that's not reflected in the costs that they pay. As we've heard already for most businesses, that's noise on a profit and loss sheet. It doesn't even feature. As a result, they have gaps in their water use data. They undertook at the time and still to a certain extent undertake one-off CSR initiatives to deal with the issue. And fundamentally, they're unfamiliar and unaware of the river basins upon which they depend fundamentally. 
whether that's because they operate within them, they buy from them, or they sell to them. So our process, the process that CDP runs, which is a voluntary process, and we now engage with more than 5,000 of these companies worldwide, is to try and transform that way of thinking, to raise the strategic importance of water within the company so that they start treating the resource with the appropriate measures and respect that it deserves. We provide a request for information on the base of it, very simple. It's an information request, it's a survey that goes out on an annual basis. But it poses questions to companies that they may not have ever considered before. Are you exposed to water-related risks that may generate a substantive change in your business revenue or operations? For many, that really is a new question that the CEO has never considered. So you can imagine when we spark that conversation, it leads to a re a repercussions within the business. They collect data that they've never collected before. They recognize the importance of the water managers within their business for the very first time. Um, they cre create the answers, they provide it back to the 680 institutional investors who are asking it and put systems in place to ensure that they can provide a better answer next year. So it's a really powerful and uh, transformational system that we provide. What we recognised initially was that the strategic importance of water, as I said, is not recognised in many businesses. And what ultimately matters to a business is that ability to generate a return, create profit and satisfy shareholders. So we introduced a question, I designed it in 20, uh, 2014, 2013, which was to try and under, help the business understand the importance of the river basin. So we began asking companies to report the total financial value, whether that's revenue, profit, or cost of goods sold, that may be at risk in each river basin in which they operate. It sparked the first question from the sustainability teams who are typically used to dealing with these questionnaires. I don't have access to that financial data. You know, I don't know what that information is. And I said, so what does that mean? He said, well, I'm going to have to go and talk to our finance team. Said, exactly, that's exactly what we want. And, and they said, but the finance team don't know what a river basin is. I said, exactly, let's go and help them understand what that is. And we've seen a dramatic shift in the way in which businesses, some of them at least, are dealing with the issue and responding. And one of these can be seen through the corporate water targets and goals that companies have traditionally set. So in 2011, the goals when targets were typically very vanilla, very boring, very sort of traditional and what you would expect from a business, not overly innovative at all. Efficiency, absolute reduction, quality of discharges, improvements in those. What we see today, or in fact 2017, because we're still waiting for our 2018 data to come in, is the much broader variety of targets that companies are now setting. And that is because that question has enabled them to recognize and understand that the health of the river basin is synonymous with the health of the business. And if you don't have a healthy river basin, you will not have a healthy business. So you'll see that the second most common goal that companies are pursuing is watershed remediation, habitat restoration and preservation. And that can only be a good thing. But this is one of the most disappointing pieces of statistics that I'm going to talk about today and is one of the most disappointing targets and pieces of information that we have as an institution today. Unfortunately, all of this great work really is only real, resulting in incremental changes from within those businesses. We looked at the 300 companies that have been consistently reporting to investors via CDP for the last three years, and the number of those companies that are consistently reducing their water withdrawals. Now, I realize that that's an imperfect metric. It's not the only metric that we should measure these corporations by, but it is an important one, and it is in a measure of how seriously or not they're taking this issue. And of the 300 that we analysed, only 35 are consistently reducing their water withdrawals. Arguably, that is insufficient to deal with the challenges that we're facing and to meet the goals that Peter outlined of the 2030 supply-demand deficit that we must meet. Uh, sorry, 2030, 40% uh, yeah, supply-demand deficit. So we need to bring about more fundamental, transformational, transitional change we need to continue to change the conversations within organizations so that they are empowered to make the transformations that they need. For me, the future, uh, what the future holds is that these interventions will challenge and change the fundamental economic system, as Gonzalo was talking about before, and the fundamental assumptions of business planning. I believe that stress testing business models against some sort of sustainable water future scenario 
may be a significant key in unlocking innovation in business models, product offerings, and partnerships. And I'm dying and desperate to ask companies this question, how does your business model stack up against this water secure future? But I can't at the moment. And this is my call to the academics and, and researchers in the room. We need more, um, uh, we need to strengthen the knowledge base. We need more research to develop future water scenarios that resonate with business and can be implemented at scale. We need it so that a, 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 a scenario that can be issued to the corporation's supply chains that are vast but hold significant potential. I, meant, I didn't mention, but another key stakeholder of ours is, is commercial banks. Commercial banks control two thirds of the world's money and for those of you that may have watched The Wire or have been fans of The Wire, their motto, their motto is follow the money. If we can change the way in which that two thirds of the world's money is allocated, then I think we've changed the rules of the game. So we need, however, evidence of the materiality of water security issues for the financial system, in particular commercial banks. I need that authority to then be able to go to a commercial bank and ask about how they're factoring these issues into their lending practices, because I can guarantee today they are not doing so. So if we are to achieve our goals, sustainable water management needs to become a fundamental pillar of how we manage our economy. I stand ready to enable us to do so, and with your help, look forward to moving this forward. Muchas gracias.